Well, this is a sermon in that series towards a community of grace. It's not that we aren't a community of grace, because we are, but there's always room for growth. Throughout the years, and certainly throughout recent history, lots of people have come up to me to say, so what are we going to do to get young people into church? What are we going to do to get more people into church? What's going to happen? Where's our future? Huh. You know, the, the, uh, there was a recent study released by PIRR, and I think I can almost tell you what that is. The Public Religion Research Institute released a study called America's Changing Religious Identity that was really, really interesting that shows that while the group of people who consider themselves to be non-religious, not affiliated with any religion, continues to grow the number of people in white Protestant churches is in decline. It would seem that it has to do with ethnicity because ethnic churches are growing, but we Anglos are in decline regardless of theology. Hmm. What are we going to do? Well, it used to be that I knew. Boy, right out of seminary, I went to a church that had an evangelism machine. First of all, they had the team of 70, and every Tuesday night we would send out 70 callers to visit in the homes of people that had visited in our worship service. Every Tuesday night, we'd go and visit. The people who had visited in our worship began to expect it, began to turn off their porch lights. <laughs> in 1984, we ran a program, an old disciple program called All Church Evangelism, in which we collected the names of hundreds of people who somebody thought should be in church. And we visited them. This program involved hundreds of people. And in one year, we ran the program twice and received 284 new members into the life of the church. I went with the, the program's director, and we went to the bar across the street from the church and, and one of our names was one of the barmaids. And so we went over and got her transfer of membership, even though she never came to church, ever. It was an amazing event. It was really amazing that a year later, our attendance and worship was the same as it had been before we ran the program. When I moved to Missouri, we tried a program called PIE. Persons interested in evangelism. And we had the names of people who had visited in our worship service. And we would meet on Tuesday night and we would go on and knock on their door and say, Hi, glad you visited. And then we would meet back at the church and eat pie. <laughs> Not real successful. We tried special Sundays honoring all the teachers in town. Honoring all the firemen and policemen. Well, they didn't really want to be honored, I guess. We tried Bring a Friend Sunday, and it would appear that the congregation there had no friends <laughs> because they didn't bring any to worship. Here, you remember that we tried delivering bread to new residents in the area with a little note that said, she We'd love to break bread with you on Sunday morning at the Lord's table. No response. We tried mailing out neighborhood newsletters that I thought were darned attractive. We mailed out thousands of them. We mailed 10,000 of them five times. No response. Huh. The truth is that what used to work doesn't. Have you noticed that the Jehovah Witnesses have set up shop in front of the downtown library. You know why they're doing that? 
because going door to door doesn't work anymore. People won't open their doors. Youch. Hmm. And one of the things that we know all too often is that our children don't want our stuff. They don't want our china, they don't want our silver, and they don't want our church. Hmm. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Well, I've been thinking on this a really long time. It seems to me that there are three things we need to do. The first of all is to understand that all of those programs had virtually nothing to do with evangelism. Evangelism is proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's evangelism. What we were doing was church growth, trying to get people into our pews. We wanted more people in our pews, and we never got around to talking about faith. I have had to ask God's forgiveness for all of those programs that I participated in because they were not evangelism. They were hollow shells that had to do with getting people into <clears throat> worship, but not into Jesus. The second thing we've got to do is we've got to decide and agree that there is no program that will solve our problem. There is no program we can do that will fill our pews. Three, we've got to go back to the beginning. We've got to go back to the ministry of Jesus. You realize that Jesus was a terrible evangelist. Never held a crusade, never offered an altar call, he never ran any kind of program at all to get people to follow him. In fact, there was one point where he turned around and there were too many people following him, so he tried to get half of them to go home. <laughs> what kind of evangelism is that? Well, there's one story that gives me some guidance. It's in the third chapter of John. It's the story of Jesus and the woman at the well. And, and you all are church broke. And I'll bet you know that story. Jesus is in Samaria. That's interesting. He stops at a well. That's interesting. And he begins to talk with a Samaritan woman, which was scandalous. Now, all of that could, I could preach on for weeks. But what's really interesting to me is the end of the story. I'm reading from the third chapter of John, beginning at the 27th verse. Then, just then, his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman. But no one said, well, what do you want, or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I've ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? And they left the city and were on their way to him. This woman had a conversation with Jesus. And when it was over, she immediately ran to tell people what had happened. And many Samaritans, skipping down 10 verses, many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I've ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. And they said to the woman, it's no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we've heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. Do you see it? That woman's encounter with Jesus transformed her life. She found something that fed the deepest hunger in her being. And she couldn't wait to tell others about it. She couldn't wait. You know, it was a biblical scholar, Eugene Nida, who defined evangelism as one beggar telling another beggar where to find food. 
That's what evangelism is. It's not a program. Evangelism is when you tell people what Jesus has done in your life. Hmm. You know, it was really interesting that in the 9 o'clock service, it was at this point in the sermon, that I have never seen people so, I don't know, anxious about a sermon. Because I know what they were thinking. Oh, no. No, no, no. I would rather work in the church nursery for the next three years than tell somebody about my faith. I don't ever want to talk about my own experience of God. Huh. But that's what it takes. That's what evangelism is. It's simply talking about your faith. Let me tell you about something even harder. And that is that the surrounding world has heard all of the words that they want to hear about Jesus. They know the words. Did you realize that the end of the world didn't happen yesterday? Some <clears throat> preacher had figured out that the end of the world was yesterday. We were going to hit, be hit by a planet that doesn't actually exist. And that was going to be the end of the world. We were all going to be raptured. The watching world has heard all the words that they want to hear. They want to see faith put into action. They want to see people of integrity and joy and hope. The watching world wants to see people that live such an incredible life that they want to find out what's up. They want to know how it's possible. It was St. Francis of Assisi who said, boldly proclaim the gospel wherever you go. Use words only when necessary. He was right. But you know, sometimes the words are necessary. Sometimes you got to say the words. Uncomfortable yet? Decades ago, I led a program called 2-7. It was a lot of fun. It was a discipleship program uh, written by the Navigators, and it was pretty popular for uh, a while. I remember one of the assignments was to write down your testimony. Your story of faith. And you need to be able to write it on a file card. Wow. You know, that was a challenge. That was hard. Because you realize that I was raised in church. I'm a church friend. I have no story of conversion. But I did it anyway. It was worthwhile. <coughs> I've lost the card. <laughs> if I were to do that now, I would need to use both sides of the card. Beginning with my story of faith. As I said, I have no great conversion story. I was born into faith. But you know that in faith, in Jesus, I have found hope for every situation, joy for every tomorrow. I have found my identity as a beloved child of God who is loved forever. I have found in my faith what really matters in life, what really counts. I have found my most precious possession, which is my faith. I can write that down on the front side of that card. And on the back side, I would have to talk about the church. It was theologian Georgia Harkness who was once asked, can you be a Christian and not be part of the church? Her answer was, well, I suppose, but I don't know why you'd want to. Hmm. 
I get that. Now, I can go on and on about the imperfections of the church. <laughs> I love it when somebody comes to me and says, you know what's the matter with this church? You know, I want to respond with, I don't have any idea at all. <laughs> yeah, right. But you know that in the church, I have rubbed elbows with people of faith. And I have been transformed by that. I have seen, I've been in committee and board meetings where people got upset with one another, and yet they hung in with one another and even continued to worship together. I have seen the church filled with people who recognize their imperfections and are trying, <coughs> trying to make the world better. I've been transformed by the church. It's not always been painless. It's not been without its problems, but I'm grateful for the church. And if I'm gonna give my testimony, I've gotta talk about the church and how it shaped me and transformed me. So here's my challenge to you. Did you notice that for the first time in recorded history, on the back of that white sheet of paper, there is nothing. It is blank. Here's your challenge. Can you write your testimony down? Can you write down your story of why you're in Christ? Why you're in the church? And of course you realize that if you can't do it, you may want to consider what you're doing here. <laughs> the truth is that God is like a mighty wind blowing through the universe, blowing us towards the kingdom of God, of peace and justice. And God has been blowing through your life since the very beginning, transforming you, shaping you, using you, you may not have been able to name it or, or recognize it, but God's always been there in your life. Can you tell the story? <coughs> Using the back of that insert, <coughs> can you write your story? And not only that, can you begin to pray for an opportunity to share that story with someone? Not in an obnoxious manner. Not beginning with, if you died tonight, do you know where your soul would go for all eternity? <laughs> but could you write your story saying that in Christ, I have been transformed? Could you write your story and then pray for an opportunity to use it? That's evangelism in the 21st century. Would you pray with me? God, it is a hard thing to talk about our faith because we're putting out there for rejection, maybe, the most important thing in our lives. Help us to be brave, being willing to talk about where our life's been touched by your love. In the name of Christ, amen.